Well, I am so excited to start a new mess series called Breaking Strongholds. Everybody say Breaking Strongholds, okay? Strongholds. Say it like a minute, Breaking Strongholds, okay? Breaking strongholds. And uh, we'll be going through this, and I'm excited to share it because we're going to be identifying in the ensuing weeks what the specific strongholds are. And when you identify it, that's the beginning of overcoming it. Siri, just some, you know, anytime I see serious, serious, Siri comes on. All right, I, I, I don't know, I gotta turn that feature off here. I'm like, what in the world? Okay. But uh, I am seriously excited about uh, sharing this message series. All right. And today is the start off of it, and the message is actually just for that uh, breaking strongholds. But I really believe this is one of the most, not, not that previous mess series are, but this is really important because it's going to be eye engaging. And I also want to be um, very upfront with you as I've been praying. We're going to ramp up the spiritual warfare. And there's going to be greater spiritual attack. Why? Because there's going to be greater spiritual breakthroughs. And I don't know about you. If you want to just stay and let the enemy kind of have his way, that's up to you. But I don't know about you, but at this church, we, we're here because Jesus has come to overcome. And we want to do whatever is necessary to overcome the things uh, that Christ wants us to overcome. So there's going to be a little bit more spiritual intensity, but it just shows that we're getting the enemy nervous uh, because Christ is taking over fully in all areas of our lives. So I'm excited to share that. And I, I want to just uh, start this off today in part one of our message series, Breaking Strongholds, with Mark chapter 9, verses 17 to 27. And I'm going to be asking a few minutes for us to be standing. And I, but I want to form on any newcomers, just a heads up, I'm a loud preacher. And praise be to God, God has been so good. God provided new speakers for us. I'm going to be even louder, okay? So, uh, but we're going to get excited. And we like to be call and responsive. So let's be responsive. Let's proclaim and declare God's word and agree with it. Can I get it loud? Amen. All right? So let's all stand up for the reading of God's holy word. Mark chapter 9, verses 17 to 27. Mark chapter 9, verses 17 to 27. We have it up here on the screen. If you can file, uh, silently read along. I'll read, I'm going to read out loud God's holy word. Mark chapter 9, verses 17 to 27. If you found it and you're trapped with me, can I get an amen? Okay. Amen. All right. Let me read out loud God's holy word if you silently read along with me. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Everybody say could not, okay? You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long should I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit, the evil spirit that is, saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But you, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Verse 23, if you can, but I want you to note, it's a question mark. Everybody say question mark, okay? Most of us take it like, but if you can, every, but Jesus is throwing the question. The man is saying, but if you, Jesus, can do anything, take pity and help us. And Jesus responds by saying, but if you can. It's not a matter of God can or can God can. Can I get an amen, right? Then he turns and says, but if you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for the one who believes. That deserves a loud amen, all right? Amen. And then 24, verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Isn't that interesting? I believe, but help me to overcome my unbelief. So there are measures of faith, but there's measures of unbelief that holds us down. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you. Everybody say, I command you. Come out of him and never enter him again. Verse 26, the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. 
But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Before you sit down, like I said, I'm going to share with you the sermon title and mess series, sermon title today, Breaking Strongholds, for the mess series entitled Breaking Strongholds. And I want to talk about how do we effectively break any strongholds in our lives. Everybody take your right hand's fingers. Let me take you participatory. Do it for the Lord. You're not doing it for me. You're doing it saying, Lord, I agree with God's word. I believe your word has power to separate the bone and marrow. It has power to demolish strongholds. Can I get an amen, right? And so I'm not here just to come to church. I want to be set free. I want captives to be set free in this place. I want the devil crying in this place and the angels rejoicing and God's people rejoicing and dancing in the Lord. Can I get a loud amen, all right? So I'm challenging you. Let's be a revival church. Let's revive. Let's not just have a service. Let's break the chains of the enemy. Can I get an amen, all right? So do it with gusto. Receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now receive that anointing and with gusto, find four people next to you, behind you, make eye contact and say, you got to break the strongholds in your life. You got to break the strongholds in your life. Say it like you mean it and mean it like you say it. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Now, as I was praying about this message series and our 2019 theme is higher. Everybody say higher. And what I felt was God was saying is, you know, you're a healthy church, but I want you to ramp up here. Take it higher. Take the praise higher. Take the prayer higher. Take the people higher. Take their faith higher. Take their perseverance higher. Do everything higher for the glory of God. See, God graduates. It's just like your kids graduated from fifth grade to sixth grade. God is not a static God. God is a dynamic God that wants to elevate and graduate his children to the next level of faith. Can I get an amen, right? To experience God's as we go to the next level of faith, God wants to experience the next level of God's faithfulness. But that also means I realized God was pointing this out to me. Stephen, isn't it amazing that when we read the New Testament account in the life of Jesus and the disciples in the early church, it was readily, you find many counts of strongholds, demonic possession and oppression being delivered, sicknesses and, and Anything that binded people were identified and broken. And today, and I'm not saying this as a criticism, but as a, just as an observation. We've sterilized churches and ministries to just feel good. We want people to feel good. But I want to let you know, I believe God wants every Bible-believing church, especially including ours, to not just have good services where people feel good by a good message. I really believe God wants to set his people free. I believe that it's amazing that back in the day, people were being delivered and saved and set free. And today we just say, oh, I hope you like that message. Go home in the grace of God. And marriages and families and children are still messed up. And I felt God was saying, Stephen... Take it to the next level. I want you to challenge yourself and the people that any demon that tries to set foot in this place will have no chance in our services. That people that might have been living in darkness and depression, that depression has no chance in the hope of glory of Christ that rests in this place. So I want to challenge you because some of you have never heard messages like this. It's usually dealing with felt needs. And those are all great. Don't get me wrong. Jesus preached the felt needs, but he also set people free spiritually. He preached the felt needs, but he also dealt with the spiritual issues and set them free. But today we more are contained with just meeting felt needs. And some of you might have never heard this, but I just felt like, you know what? We got to open our eyes. Point to someone next to you. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. And realize there is a spiritual battle. Satan wants to remain hidden, and when you can't identify and find the enemy, he has greater chance of doing guerrilla warfare, popping up and destroying some air, and then going into hiding again. But I praise God for the fact that as we go through this message series, we're saying, say no more, because the light will overcome the darkness. So I want to share with you, how do we effectively break any strongholds in our lives? Because it's not just the truth will set you free, it's knowing the truth and living it out that sets you free. Now, let me start out by this way. Jonathan Rainwright was the only U.S. American general that was captured as a POW prison of war in World War II to Japan. He had been the sec put in command by General Douglas MacArthur to protect the Philippines. 
And in World War II, because the Japanese forces came and they're ravaging and put so much casualties on the U.S. Allied forces, General Wayne White went against MacArthur's orders to never surrender, and he surrendered to try to save his men. So he was captured, and he was put in a POW prisoner of war camp in a remote part of Mongolia. And he was so down and out and discouraged that he had given it up. But he tried to hold his honor and integrity even in the POW camp, try to encourage the men that were there. And when, make a long story short, General Douglas MacArthur finally was able to win and defeat the enemy in Japan at that time in World War II. And as a result, the war was over. And when the war was over, through telegram was sent to all the Japanese prisoner of war camps. A telegram was sent saying that Japan had lost the war and the U.S. had won. And therefore, what now needed to happen, every superintendent, every commandant of these prisoner of war camps that were in charge of these camps had to find the highest allied officer and say, we surrender to you because we lost the war. And the story goes that all the POW camps, the commandants, found that God received the telegram and went and found the highest allied officer and said, we surrender to you because we lost the war. However, everybody say however, okay? The one POW camp in the remote part of Mongolia, that commandant received the telegram but refused to tell the prisoners. And so he held out for the longest time and, and General Wainwright never knew that the war was over and that his team had won. And MacArthur was trying to look for his second command general. Where is he? And so he sent a high officer to look for him and found him. And he dispatched his high officer. And when he came to the POW camp, he went to the fence and said, I need to find General Wainwright. And so General Wainwright was brought to the fence. And then the emissary officer said, General, the enemy has been defeated. We've won the war. They're supposed to surrender to you. So General Ray White took the news, took that truth, then walked quietly, walked into the commandant's office, and without raising his voice and said, my commander in chief has defeated your commander in chief. Now, I have won and gained control and power over you. And in the same way, dear friends, we, Jesus has won the victory. Can I get an amen, right? Amen. And the enemy has been defeated. Satan has been defeated. Can I get an amen, right? But if there's an area that Satan will not acquiesce and let you know, then you act and live like a continual POW, prison of war. We're saved and we've been won, won the victory in Jesus, but we still act and think that we're a prisoner of war and we take orders from the enemy. But that has to stop starting today. Can I get an amen? amen. So I wanna share with you how do we break these strongholds. The first thing that I wanna share with you is that you need to identify strongholds. Everybody say identify strongholds, okay? <laughs> Verses 17 to 19 in the story, and I know that for some of you who maybe are not as well Bible verse, it looks like a horror movie from Hollywood. There's a de demon possessed person all that. But I want to just kind of highlight on this because it is real. There is a real adversary, even though despite the fact that service in the United States, most people, even believers today in the United States, don't believe that there's an actual devil. But there is an adversary, the Bible says, and he is the devil. And here we see one of his cohorts, one of his underlings, tormenting a little boy. A man in the crowd answered, Father, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long should I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. When the, Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. Now, some of people today, even scholars, say that that doesn't have to happen anymore today. But I tell you, has anything changed? If Jesus ministered like this, 
Why is the church afraid to minister like this? Why? Because we want to keep it hygienic, but we'll let the enemy continue to exist when we don't expose them by the light. And here I want to challenge you that there are strongholds, spiritual strongholds that the Bible talks about. You may not have been aware of it, but praise be to God, you're here and God wants to reveal to you that there is an enemy that's out to kill Rob and destroy your life. And there are strongholds that the enemy's trying to do. And here in this passage, we see Jesus coming upon a father whose son since childhood had been really been taken ravaged by an evil spirit. Jesus identifies it and it says it's not just some type of physiological thing. It's a mute and dumb spirit and he rebuked it, identified it and he rebuked it right there. And that's when the deliverance happened. And so I want to challenge you with this warning. Everybody say warning, okay? I want you to be understanding of this. I don't want you to over-spiritualize everything. Okay, that's one extreme danger. We could over-spiritualize everything. Oh, I feel the breath of the Holy Spirit. No, that was a heating unit that just turned on. Okay. Oh, my car battery died today. It's been demonized. Usually, no, it's because you left the light on, okay? <laughs> but I will also say this. If you're trying to go to church and it happened, maybe there's a little bit more of a correlation. But if it's just because normal routine, think about it this way. John Wimber said this, and it was so funny. When he became a believer, he started going to church, and he realized the minister going to church, he, he and his wife on the way to church would argue every single Sunday on the way to church. Because he was a new believer, he thought that was normal. And then he realized that all the other families at church had been arguing on the way to church too. And he's like, well, that's so strange. And then he realized it's because the enemy is trying to rob them of joy before they go to church. So I want you to be understanding. You need to be discerning. You don't, you don't need to over-spiritualize. Oh, I burned my, my mouth on hot coffee. That's the devil trying to attack me. No, 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 no. It's just you not testing how hot the temperature of the coffee was. So don't, there's a danger of over-spiritualizing. Everybody say over-spiritualizing. At the same time, there's the other danger, the other extreme of under-spiritualizing things. Why do I always get into so many arguments with my family? Why am I prone to these types of hang-ups and all that? It may be something, not just physical but there may be a spiritual thing to it as well so what we need to pray and, I, and this is something amazing that the bible says the bible says god wants to give wisdom to all those who ask him so we need to ask for wisdom and spiritual discernment everybody say spiritual discernment okay if there's one thing i want you to pray for starting this week ask god for spiritual discernment help me to test the spirits to see it's from you oh god or from the enemy from the world or from the flesh and god says he wants to give us spiritual discernment so the danger of over-spiritualizing things and under-spiritualizing things. You know, for instance, my daughter has seizures. And we prayed over it. My wife and I, is it some demonized thing? No, it's a physiological, some things are more physiological. It's natural, it's happening. And in this instance, in the Bible here, this child that was actually having convulsions, we realized that this was something demonic. So not all things like seizures are all demonic, but sometimes it can be. But you need that spiritual discernment. So, you know, my wife and I prayed over our daughter for spirits. And no, it's just because of the brain infection that she had. Now it's actually taking root and showing itself in seizures. But I will also say this because that's why I want to ramp it up. You know, you youth, I know you guys don't see it, but there is a spiritual battle. And even when I was in seminary, I studied the word of God. I, I did papers on Jesus delivering people, all these things. And yet, I never saw it until I was doing full-time ministry. And what you saw here, it happened right before my eyes. And this is not to scare anyone, but to let you know we have a real adversary. This girl who's not even five feet, I'm not gonna mention her name, her, and in a prayer meeting Friday night, she just started showing some signs, making some weird noise and weird face, contorted face. And then she started manifesting and I, I had read about it, I studied it, but man, it was scary. It's like, my goodness, what's going on? And so we had three or four big guys trying to hold her down and she was throwing them off. And you know what? I'm telling you, 
God is my witness, the enemy is real. And we just like to think that, oh, it's just this and that. We don't realize that there's a spiritual battle going on. But I do have a good news for you because the power in the name of Jesus is greater than the enemy. And we're able to deliver that person. Now she is, she and her husband are missionaries overseas. Can I get an amen to that? But it is a real thing. And here we need to identify what strongholds are. Let me first get to find what strongholds are. Stronghold, just according to a regular dictionary, says is a well-fortified place or a fortress. Everybody say fortress, okay? So think about a fortress that's in someone's life. It could be their heart and their mind. And it's a place that serves as a center of a group or as a militants or a person's holding, holding, stronghold, holding a controversial viewpoint. So it's something that goes against what was originally intended. So example, a campus was a stronghold of hatred and racism, a controversial, contrary opposing viewpoint right there. So whenever we have strongholds, it's opposing what God intended. It's being controversial to what God intended and fighting us in that way. So let me define what spiritual strongholds are. Turn to the next slide, please. A spiritual stronghold is something or anything that has a stronghold of the presence, power, control, and influence and dominance in your area, in your land. It could be your heart, in your mind, in your relationship, in the land, even in the promised land by the enemy. And it's there to kill, steal, and destroy your life and to keep you from inheriting God's full plans, purpose, and promise. Now, like I said, the enemy is real, but God's power is greater. Can I get an amen, right? But I also want to let you know, because there's a lot of teachings. You Google up there, whatever, you can see all these teachings. But I want you to go by what the word of God says. And I was taught when I was growing up erroneously. I was taught that once you become a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you, and you can never have any type of demonic influence in your life. And so that's what I, I like that. I'm like, yeah, seal the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's great. And then that's what I wanted to hold on to and cling to. And then when I went to seminary, there was one professor who was doing deliverance ministry. And when he shared that most of his deliverance ministry was over Christians, I said, that's not possible. How could you be doing deliverance ministry over Christians? And then he said something that was very, very clear. He said, Christians, when they become born again believers, they accept Jesus Christ, they have the Holy Spirit that comes inside them. Can I get an amen, right? And it's a seal. The Holy Spirit is a seal that we are God's children and nothing can take away that salvation and our standing as God's children. Are you trapped with me? Can I get an amen, right? So he said, you got to understand two words. Oppression and possession and he said possession is when the enemy can come and take full possession of a person's life and he said that only happens to non-believers because they don't have the holy spirit inside them so possession is when an enemy comes and takes full control and controls and manipulates and tries to destroy and oppress and suppress their lives. And that happens to non-believers. That's possession. But then he said there's also what's called oppression. Everybody say oppression. Oppression is when you allow the enemy to have some type of foothold which becomes a stronghold. He doesn't fully possess you, but you're giving him access to come into your life and have some area of his presence and some area of influence over you. And I said, how can this be? We have the Holy Spirit inside us. How can we allow the enemy to just kind of control us when we're fully controlled, uh, we're supposed to be under the possession, we're temples of the Holy Spirit. And he said this, well, a lot of Christians sin, don't they? And they have the Holy Spirit inside them, but they still sin. And sometimes they don't confess their sin, the sin is still there, but it grieves the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't leave them, but it's there. So he said, Oppression happens to believers and it can happen to unbelievers. So unbelievers could get not to the full, possess full possession, but if they keep allowing it, it can lead to that. But for believers, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, the devil cannot fully possess us. Can it get a loud amen to that, right? That's shouting you. Somebody shout amen to that, right? 
because we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. But those of you who question that, let me say this. Why is it then that a born-again pastor that even years ago can preach and bring evangelism and save so many people, at the same time, he had a stronghold of lust and was having an adulterous affair? How can the Holy Spirit be in that person and yet still be using that person to save you? It's because of God's amazing grace. God still used that person, but that sin was secret. That sin was secret, and the person was secretly sinning and lusting and forging out an adulterous relationship. And as a result, he had a stronghold. So I want to be very clear: the devil cannot fully possess any believer, but we do sometimes give him access. You have your house, but sometimes you could leave your door unlocked and let a rodent come in. And if you don't root it out, it'll stay there. And it'll make a little foothold and nest in your home. So in the same way, I want to let you know, how do strongholds happen? Well, let me give you four tactics of the enemy. Everybody say four tactics, okay? <laughs> the first is, he likes to deceive and lie. Everybody say lies, okay? The Bible says, he's the father of lies, the devil is. He comes and he lies to you. Do you think God's going to accept your praise today? Come on. I saw you and God saw what you did last night. You're a hypocrite. Do you really think God's going to bless your life after what you've done? He's the father of lies. The second thing that the enemy tries to do, he's the accuser. Everybody say accuser, okay? He uses accusations. He's the, the Bible says the accuser of the brethren. Oh, you're standing condemned. You're not worthy. You're a lousy Son, daughter, you're a lousy child of God. You're not faithful. He accuses us and tries to bring our faith down. A third area that Satan tries to do, God never tempts us, but Satan tries to tempt. He tempts us. Everybody say tempts, okay? He uses temptations, makes us fall to the desires of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and he makes us fall into sin. And the fourth tactic the enemy tries to do, he tries to establish a stronghold. And strongholds don't just pop up overnight. Strongholds come when you continually do this. When there's a continual or habitual sin, you ask God for forgiveness, and he forgives you every time, but you keep doing it, you're giving the enemy more access and authority over your life because you're allowing him in each and every time habitually. And it doesn't even have to be said. It could be a lie, a thought that you completely and continuously, habitually allow to come into your life. Many of you are waiting for God's promise. Isn't it amazing you come to church? Yes, I want to believe the promise of God. I know you have a plan for my life. Yes, my heart is, is raising up right now during the service. And then as soon as you're going to the parking lot, the enemy's there with his lies and accusations. I know you said amen. I know you prayed. But you're going to go back home to the same situation. You're going to go to the same environment. Nothing's changed for all these years. And you know what? We start dwelling on it habitually. Yeah, where are you, God? Where are you? Is this ever going to happen? I see other people. Is it ever going to happen for me? And you believe the lie and the accusation of the enemy. And it doesn't have to be habitual sin, but it is a habitual lie of the enemy. And that's why Proverbs says, so as a man thinketh, he becomes. That's why the Bible says repentance. It's not just saying, I'm sorry for my sin. Repentance is changing your thinking in your mind. But we think habitually the lies of the enemy more than the truth of God, don't we? You go home and on Monday, all of a sudden, something trips you up and you're like, yeah, you know what? That, that word on Sunday, that's great, but maybe it doesn't apply. Habitually, you're giving the enemy a foothold. And the foothold, you give him access, becomes a larger foothold, a larger foothold, until it becomes a stronghold in your mind and then eventually down into your heart. That's the four tactics that the enemy uses. And that's how it starts from a small little entry point, and then we keep allowing it to happen by our sins and by our thinking the lies of the enemy over and over habitually, it becomes a stronghold. And that's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, if we put up the screen, the Bible verse 2 Corinthians, 
This is Paul saying, for the weapons of our warfare, spiritual warfare, are not of the world or of the flesh, but have divine power. If I say divine power, okay? To what? Destroy what? Strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ Jesus. Do you see how Paul makes it clear? The strongholds start in our minds by our sins, but also by our thinking. We destroy every argument. Arguments happen when we're thinking it and speaking it out loud. Every lofty opinion, it comes, speculations come because we're thinking about it in our minds. Against the knowledge of God and take every thought, all our thoughts starts as the battle of the minds. So that's why most Christians start being defeated because they're getting defeated. They're letting the enemy have strongholds in their minds. And when it gets bigger and bigger strongholds there, and then it seeps into their heart and it robs them of the despair and their joy. But I have good news. Everybody shout good news. Because this message is letting you know that the enemy may be trying to have strongholds, but our God is stronger than that. And God has armed every one of his children with weapons, not of this world. We don't need a Glock. We don't need an M50 gun. We don't need an M1 Abraham saying we have spiritual weapons that God has given every one of his children. Can I get an amen to that? You could be the youngest believer that just got saved two weeks ago. You have the same armor of God. You could be a believer that have been a believer for 20 years. You have the same armor of God. The weapons we have are not of this world. You may not see it, but God has blessed us with every spiritual your blessing and the heavenly realms and that includes the weapons of warfare and we have power not just the weapons but power and I shall power okay to destroy strongholds and this is where I felt God was saying Stephen I want you to be frustrated in a holy way don't just have nice services I want you to tear down strongholds in the mighty name of Jesus every Sunday I don't want you people to just come and say, oh, that was nice. That was a great worship, a great praise. No, I want you to go for it and let the devil know that there is a church in Irvine that believes in the power of Christ. Resurrection power, power to save, power to heal, power to set people free. Can I get an amen to that? And we're not here to play service. We're here to pray and to praise and to persevere until the chains are broken in the mighty name of Jesus. Point to someone next say, we're taking it to a next level. We're taking it to a next level. Point to someone next say it like there. Now, if you agree with me, can I get a loud amen to that? So we have all this power, but we don't use it on Sundays. And I pray that every Sunday somebody came here with the spirit of depression, depression will flee in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that someone came here with the spirit of divorce in their marriage, the v, divorce will be divorced in Jesus' mighty name, all right? I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that some, somebody might come here and your son has become a prodigal that through the prayers and that as we pray, that son or daughter is going to be seized by the Holy Spirit. He may be ready to put some type of crack cocaine in his body, but he's seized by the Holy Spirit right there and he turns around and comes back in the mighty name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's how big my God is. He's a God not just to comfort, but but to overcome and to conquer in Jesus' mighty name. So we need to identify the strongholds. And we're going to be going through that in the ensuing weeks. Point of you got to identify what's in your life. you got to identify what's in your life. The second thing I want to share with you are the characteristics. Everybody say characteristics. characteristics. The characteristics of strongholds. Verse 17 to 18, if we put up on the screen. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Robbed, to kill, rob, steal, and destroy. Whenever it seizes him, see the oppression? It throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive it out, the spirit. But the disciples, but they could not. And so what I want to share with you is some of the characteristics. Most of the characteristics of the strongholds is this. It's usually hard to identify. Because unlike a fortress that you see upon a land, you see it there, the enemy has hidden fortresses or strongholds in your mind and some to the degree that it's gotten into your heart and he wants to remain hidden. He doesn't want you to believe he's there. But the symptoms will show up. Your anger rages. Your addiction pops up. Your family has generational things, but then he does it, and then he recedes into the background. 
or let me mess up that generation, that child, the next generation, let me mess them up. Let me let them get abused just like his father was. Let me do it and let me just backdrop. And so these things happen over and over and over again. See, one of the characteristics of strongholds is it's hidden and Satan tries to remain hidden in that way. But another characteristic of strongholds is it's the opposite spirit of what God intended for you. You know the strongholds in the promised land for the people of Israel in the Old Testament? Those strongholds represented the enemy saying, I defiantly contradict what God's purpose for you is here. Some of you have a stronghold of finances. And that stronghold is indication when you see a stronghold, if you see divorce in your family line, you know why? It's the opposite spirit of what God intended. God intended for your family name to be generations of healthy marriages of faith. But Satan came in the opposite spirit to kill Rob and destroy, and he fortified that, and he's trying to make it happen all over again. Others of you had substance abuse or addictions or weaknesses. God wanted you to be filled and to be pure and to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but he wanted to come and contaminate you. And therefore, you fall into these substance addictions or pornography and all these things. God wanted you to have a pure life and generations, the blessed are the pure, for they will see God. But Satan saw that and came in the opposite spirit. And another characteristic of strongholds is it could be inside, but it's also territory as well. That's why Daniel, we're going to go through this later on in this message series. Daniel had to pray and he fasted and prayed for 21 days. And he didn't see anything happen until the archangel came and said, Daniel, God has heard your prayers from the first moment that you start praying and fasting. But I was detained by the prince of Persia. There are territory of demonic spirits. I was fighting him and he was trying to detain me, but I was finally was able to come in here and bring the answer to your prayers. So that's why even in this area, think about it. I mentioned this before. When you see a stronghold, it's the opposite spirit of what God intended. Every city in this country, in the world, God, it wasn't because people decided, let's start a, uh, because it's a trade route or a nice body of water, let's start a city or township. No, God ordained it. God is the God of the city. Can I get an amen, right? But you see how Satan comes and makes a strong in the opposite spirit. Los Angeles, city of angels. Angelos in the New Testament means messenger of light. What is Los Angeles? Opposite spirit of what God intended. It's not a messenger of God's light. It's a messenger of darkness. God's light and purity. It's a messenger. It's a pornography capital of the world. San Francisco. Named after St. Francis of Assisi, who was one of the most aesthetic. He lived this such a pure life of purity, of sexual purity and just humility. And San Francisco has become a place of mammon, money, and homosexuality, all these things. Even Irvine, everybody say Irvine. Because God calls it the church plan. What was the, you know, they say Irvine is known as the master plan community. See. And Satan came in the opposite spirit. We're supposed to be living under the master God in heaven and how he planned it. But today, now, it's the opposite spirit. Master plan communities. We're going to live our nice families with nice gated communities. Parks every two blocks. Safest schools. FBI is one of the safest cities in that area and all that. Right? And we think that's the plan that God has for us. No, that's the opposite. God wanted us to live under Jesus, the master plan. To come and to say that we, it's not the house that we live in. It's the house of God that we're building that matters. It's not what kind of car I drive, but where God is driving my life. That my value doesn't come from nice things, but from the fact that Jesus dwells within me. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. And so we see the opposite spirit. So there's, the characteristic is the opposite spirit. So if you're going through a stronghold, I have good news for you. Remember, the devil's trying to go in the opposite contradictory thing of what God intended. And when you identify that, you can now start to understand that God has a plan. And that was your original destiny. Point to someone and say, God has a destiny for you. So I have good news. I feel preaching under the unction. I want to declare to you today, if some of you come and you feel so down and out because maybe you've been a single mom, you know what? God has been right there all the days of your life. And what the enemy has tried to take away, God will more than make up for it. Can I get an amen to that? 
And if you stay firm and say, God, I am your child, and I declare your promise over me, you know what? What has been broken will be restored, and generations of blessing will come forth, starting from you. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. For others of you who've had nominal marriages or divorced marriages and all these things, I have good news. You see the opposite of what the enemy intended, but you start declaring the goodness and the promise of God still yet come to pass in Jesus' mighty name. And when you start to fight for that, identify that, then you're going to be able to characterize what the strong ones are doing and identify and start to move in the opposite spirit. Point to someone and say, move in the opposite spirit, move in the opposite spirit. So that's some of the characteristics. And I want to challenge you, in this case here, the boy was having all these things being stealed and robbed, being convulsing and foaming and all these things. See, that's how the enemy wants to just destroy our lives. Burn you and destroy you and to kill you. But when Jesus shows up, everything changes. And I want to ask you as a church, did you come for a service or did you come for Jesus alone? You could have great singing, you could have preaching, and still miss out on Jesus. I don't know about you, but can we be a church that when God's looking at all the churches that are lining here, he sees revival, and he sees everyone's hearts are God. It's you or nothing. We just want you, Jesus. Because when you come, you change the atmosphere in my life, in my heart. You change the atmosphere in my family. That's how big our God is. Can I get an amen, right? So to realize that and to seek after the hunger of God. Point to someone say, are you here for God or are you here for church? Are you here for God or are you here for church? Because I don't know about you, but I came for God and God alone. Third and final thing I want to quickly share with you is I talked about a little bit last week about destroying, but now I want to go even further. Demolishing strongholds. Everybody say demolishing strongholds, okay? And notice what Jesus does here. Verse 22, the 26a, if you put up on the screen. This is the father speaking. This is how desperate he is. He knows Jesus and he's like, but if you can't do anything, take pity on us and help us. And then Jesus responds, if you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure. He identified, then he rebuked it. And, and you deaf and mute spirit identified and said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked and convulsed violently and came out. After, verse 28, it says, after Jesus had gone indoors, after all this happened, his disciples asked him privately, hey, Jesus, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. Everybody say prayer. Okay. Some, trans some uh, original uh, manuscript translations have prayer and fasting. Everybody say fasting. Regardless, what Jesus is saying is, this kind can come out only by more intensified, focused prayer. And this is where I felt God was saying, Stephen, I know you've been praying as a pastor for some people to experience breakthrough, doors that remain closed for some people. I want you to take it to a next level and ask the people, let's really ramp up our prayers. Take your normal prayer and ramp it up even higher. And take it in such a way that you're really dealing in the heavenly realm and asking for God to open the floodgates of heaven and start to pour out his spirit and his presence and his power more than ever before. And so when I felt that way, I felt, I felt God was saying, you know what, the disciples, they tried to rebuke that demon and nothing came out. And then Jesus comes and he rebukes it. You pure, unpure spirit, come out. And it came out. And the disciples asked him, how can we do it? Couldn't do it. And he says, only by intensified prayer and some translations and fasting. You see, God has given us gifts and talents in warfare, but it's how close we remain to Jesus that the oil of anointing flows. You could have the best gift of leading worship or preaching and teaching and all that and leadership. And that's a gift, but we could use it by the flesh or by the spirit of God. And if it's by our flesh, because we're not in close contact with God, then you could make all the things that could happen, but it will only have fleshly results and power. But we remain close contact with Jesus. Then the oil flows. Jesus was able to do it because he was the son of God, but also remained close contact with God the Father. 
So I want to ask all of you, that's what we need to do. We need to ramp up our prayer. Now, my prayer, my sense is for the next 40 days, and I know um, uh, when I, um, I sent an um, email out to many of you, some of you said, 40 days? My goodness, that's too long. But let me ask you, 40 in the, in the Bible is such a beautiful number of completion. Can I get an amen to that, right? It rained 40 days and 40 nights for Noah. The scouts, Joshua and Caleb and the 10 other guys, scouted out the promised land for 40 days. Jesus was tempted and, and prepared for ministry 40 days in the wilderness. The Israelites marched in the desert for 40 years before they entered the promised land. So 40 is a time of purification, of preparation, and breakthrough. It's preparing us for the next thing that God has in store. So that's why I want to ask all of you to really, it's not going to be mandatory, but I do want to ask you in this regard. Some of you have been waiting for a door to open. I know some of you have been praying for schools to open. I've been praying for you. But my prayer is, God, when we pray and if we fast, I guarantee this, things are going to start to happen. And let me be very clear. We're not praying and fasting to manipulate God. Some of you think, if I fast, I'm going to manipulate God to get what I want. No. When we pray with greater intensity and we fast, we're not doing it to manipulate God. We're praying for God's presence to manifest itself. That's the difference. And when we pray even further, God, we don't manipulate God. God's spirit changes us. And we get a greater view of what God intended. Can I get an amen to that? And when we get a greater view, we get in line with God's plans. But I also know this. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. And I know you've been praying, but pray like the persistence. Ramp up your prayer. And fast even and pray even further, saying this way. Fasting, what I'm asking you to do is considering this. You know, for me, it could be a meal or two. If some of you really want to ramp it up and fast three meals a day for 40 days, God bless you. That's all I'll say. I've done that once in my life, and I've done it once in my life. That's all I'll say. It made me lose 30 pounds, but I did it, and it was... Difficult. It wasn't impossible, but it was difficult, and I've done it once in my life, and I've only done it once in my life. That's all I'll say to that. I did do it when my daughter was sick, and I prayed and fasted uh, solid food for 40 days. But if you want to do it that way, I've already made a decision. I'm going to fast a meal a day. And when you fast, it's not a diet. You just don't eat food. You're taking in God's food. If you don't spend time in God's word, please don't tell me you're fasting. That's what's called intermittent fasting, you know, you're trying to use, you know, the, you're trying to lose weight. That's not spiritual fasting. Spiritual fasting is you abstain from food, but you take in God's word. Ramp up the prayer. During that time, I challenge you to pray. If you have a hard time praying, do this. Write out a list of prayer topics because most of you are like this. Dear God, thank you for this day. Please bless my work. Please bless my family. Please bless my pastor. <laughs> and then you feel guilt, devil's accusing you. What kind of prayer life is that? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, oh, I can't pray. Write it out. What do you need to pray about your spouse? What do you need to pray about your children? We need to pray for your breakthrough. Write it out and then go through it. Lord, I pray for this for my children that they would have an experience of your dreams and visions, God. I pray that they will ra be raised up to become men and women of God that will not compromise. I pray that you'll give them the wisdom of God over the wisdom of man. I pray that, Lord, for purity, that whatever happens, they will remain pure. God, the Holy Spirit will seize them. I pray, Lord God, that they will not seek popularity because they're already popular up in heaven, oh, Father God. I pray, you pray all these things. You write it out. So pray, that's how you pray with greater intensity. If you just say, God, please bless my job, God's like, how do you want me to bless your job? So pray with specificity, so write it out. And so, and I, I know some of you, I said in the thing, some of you need to fast from multimedia, you know, Facebook. In Jesus' name, I rebuke Facebook because you spend two hours a day on it. But then you come to the pastor and say, Pastor, I just don't have time to read God's word. You have all the time to read everybody's Facebook posts and even comment on it. But you can't even write little things about your time with the Lord. You know, so um, 
But can I say this? I'm, I just want to ramp it up because I'm just being honest. I think fasting with social media is good, but it's not enough. Why is the Bible, the original word for fasting, deals with food? Not just social media and things like that. Well, coffee. Coffee. But it's specifically food. Why? It's saying that I'm cleansing my body of any physical needs so that I could be more phys- spiritually in tune with you. My hunger spiritually is greater than my hunger physically. So social media is just electronically hunger. I want to ask you, your senses become more sensitive because we desire things of the flesh. But when you fast from food, you're actually saying, my hunger for the Lord is greater than the cravings of my flesh. So I want to ask you, it's it's totally voluntary, um, but we have this here at the end. I want to ask you to fill this out. You don't have to. Please don't feel that you have to. But... I want to ask you, if the Lord is prompting you to do so, I want to ask you to do it. Because why? It's important that you want to see some breakthroughs happening. And my prayer is that there's going to be some major breakthroughs that's going to be happening. Like I said, there's going to be some greater spiritual intensity. It's only because the devil knows he's being rooted out. Can I get an amen, right? But I've been praying for some of you that doors will open for you at school. I want to challenge you. What's wrong with fasting 40 days of meals? And God, whatever your perfect plan is, I say yes and amen to that right now. For those of you who have been waiting for jobs, I know the economy is bad, but remember, God is the God of the economy. He's still Lord of all, and he can provide. I talked with a brother today, even though the housing market is bad, God's still providing for him, even he's working in the housing market. Can I get an amen to that, right? So God provides. So pray and seek that. I know some of you are praying for some breakthrough physically for loved ones and all that. But whatever it is, I want to ask that you do this. In this thing, it simply says this is breakthrough prayer request. What is that breakthrough prayer request? It could be more than one, but I want you to be really specific. Go for the jugular. And then if you want a confidential, mark yes. If it's confidential, it'll only come to me and the staff. If you say no, I'm going to share it with our prayer ministry team, and they're going to be praying with you. The more people to pray, the better. Fasting what per day? Is it a meal or two? Is it meal and social media, whatever it is, per day? And then I want you to write your name. And I want you to fill it out. And at the end, I'm going to ask the ushers to collect it. And we, you will be getting a picture, a JPEG of it, as a reminder to you. Because you might say, oh, I forgot what I was going to fast on. <laughs> so we're going to send that to you as a reminder. And you could have that. We'll email it to you, and then you could use that. But I want to challenge you. That's what it means to demolish strongholds. So how do we do this? Faith. Everybody say Faith. Remember, Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can ask mountains to move. So you know what that means? It's not so much the quality and the strength of your faith. It's rather the quality and the strength of the God to whom we pray. Your faith is contingent upon not just you, but more upon God. And I love this illustration, how this one author said it. He said, if I hold a little child's hands, says, hold on to my hand, I want to lead you. And they're walking on the beach. And he says, I want you to enjoy the beach, enjoy the ride, enjoy the walk. And the little boy is holding on to the the hand, the father's hand. And the son is being tempted to go. But the father holds on and says, hold on to my hand. The father is holding the son's hand because he's so much bigger, 100 times stronger than the son's grip. So it's not so much dependent upon the son's grip, but upon the father's grip on the son. So in the same way, when we have faith and we put our faith in God, we're declaring how big and great our God is. Can I get an amen? So it's really saying, God, you are bigger than my strongholds. You're bigger than my depression. You're bigger than my poverty. You're bigger than all the things that have happened in my family. You're bigger than these things. And therefore, as I hold on to you, I know your hand is stronger and greater than that. Can I get an amen to that? So that's why it says that help me overcome unbelief. Just saying, if you can, if you can, question mark, if you have the faith not just to believe in, but believe in how big our God is, God can make it happen. And so you got to put that on, but also quickly going through here. What are the other things you need to be able to praise? Everybody say praise. Okay. 
Because praise, God inhabits the praise of his people. I want to challenge you in the mighty name of Jesus. Why is it that when I was demon de de delivering that person and somebody started playing on a little guitar, acoustic guitar, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And the de devil and that girl just looked and said, stop it. I hate it when you praise God. So I told that girl, play, play even louder and sing even louder. Why is it that when you're down, you don't want to praise? Why is it that you come to church in an argument, you don't want to praise? Because Satan hates it. When we praise, we're not just singing feely good. We're declaring the truth of God. Can I get an amen to that? Protect. Everybody say protect. Okay. Protect. Put on the full armor of God, it says in Ephesians, so that you may be able to stand your ground and know and fight the devil's schemes. You got to put on the full armor of God. And then you got to pray. The Bible says pray in all occasions. As I mentioned here, you got to intensify your prayer. And the fourth thing I want to share is proclaim. Everybody say proclaim, okay? God's spoken word is so important for every believer. I challenge you, when you have your quiet time, don't just have it quiet by reading it quietly. Declare God's word out. Why do you think God, he didn't even have to do it. He spoke and creation happened. Why do you think Jesus spoke, you deaf and mute spirit, come out? He could have just thought it and would happen. But you know why? There's power. The Bible says the tongue has the power of life and death, the blessing, the curse. So you proclaim God's words. You don't just agree with it by faith. I agree with it. You proclaim it in Jesus' mighty name. You know why? You're declaring to the devil against his lies because his lies are always coming. You're saying, devil, I stand against you by the truth of God's word. That nothing in all of creation shall separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You declare, man, you are strong, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Can I get an amen to that? And when the enemy comes, no, I'm over. No, for the weapons we have are not of this world, but have divine power to demolish strongholds in Jesus' mighty name. And as I close, just like General Wainwright, he, until he found the truth and until he proclaimed it, to the enemy, the enemy was still giving him orders. It was only when General Wainwright not only knew God's truth, but he went and approached the commandant and said, I know the truth and now I'm speaking the truth. My commander in chief has defeated your commander in chief. And when you declare it, that's how you win the faith. Why do you think Jesus defeated the enemy in the wilderness temptation? He spoke God's word aloud. So I want to challenge you, speak God's word. God's word, Bible says in Isaiah 55, never comes back void. Can I get an amen? amen? Don't go by your feelings. Declare it by faith because that's how big our God is. You declare the victory. You may not feel it and the devil is going to make it seem like shrieking. Come on. No, you're not having any power, but you are having spiritual power because Jesus' word never comes back void. And when you declare it, you will see the victory come. Can I get a loud amen to that? So I want to challenge you as we embark upon this. We're going to be going on this spiritual campaign to fast and pray for breakthroughs, spiritual breakthroughs that have been remaining, doors that have remained closed, things that haven't happened. Because you know what? I feel the time is better than ever now. God wants to show off his glory to his people. God wants his sons and daughters to be more than conquerors. Not just when our pastors, we are more than conquerors, you say amen. No, he wants you to be a more than conqueror when you're walking in that parking lot back home from church. When you go back home, when you go back to your living room, when you go to your workplace, can I get a loud amen to that? And you do it, not just by believing, but by proclaiming out loud God's word. Ramping up your prayer, putting on the full armor of God, no matter what the enemy throws at you, and then being able to understand that you put your faith in the God who is greater. You tell the de devil, you may be strong, but my God is greater. And I come against you like David did to Goliath. I come against you, Goliath, in the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the, of the, of the armies of God. He declared it again. Everybody say declare, all right? So I want you to declare God's goodness. If you declare God's goodness, say, can I get a loud amen to that? Amen. If you know that God, the hope of glory in you, has given you divine spiritual power to defeat the strongest, can I get a louder amen to that? Amen. If you're here more than just to have a service, but you really want to kick the devil's ball, can I get a louder amen, right? Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. I want you to stand up with me at this time. Let's all stand.